Now, with all of my recent videos, there seems to have been some problem with the sound that stopped anyone from being able to hear me. Um, and in this video, it's looking like that might be the wind, um, but it's not so bad at the moment. I might go somewhere else if it gets quite bad. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is, uh, well, I'll start off with the story of a, a 19th century, a 19th century linguist studying the Devonian. A linguist studying the Devonian dialect in the 19th century noticed um, that there was a certain peculiarity about the dialect. There was a little sound people would make in certain contexts within a sentence. Um, so, for example, um, in the sentence, I've seen a bird, a rural Devonian at that time would say, I've seen a bird. In the sentence, um, I've gone home, a rural Devonian at that point would say, uh, I've gone home. Um, and to anyone else, this might have just seemed like a little rural affectation that, you know, rural farm people do. Um, but of course, most things in language have an explanation and most things in language have rules governing them. And this was no exception. Um, you would actually have this uh sound, I've seen, I've gone, at the start of a, a past participle form. Um, the past participle is the form that in English we use with the auxiliary, uh, the auxiliary word have. So I have been to the shop. Um, and it's not to be confused with the past simple, which is I went to the shop, which doesn't require the auxiliary. So to form the past participle in this Devonian dialect, you had to include this sound, this uh sound, I have a gone. Um, and a few of you will already know, already have worked out where I'm going with this. Um, the sound is a direct reflection of something Old English had, but which died out in the Middle English period in most dialects, uh, and that is the y prefix. So just like in the 19th century um, dialect of Devon, this was shoved onto the starts of past participles, and it appeared in some other contexts as well, um, for example, uh, to form a plural in certain words. So ich habe jeseon fuhre um, is reflected in German and Dutch with the g prefix, ich habe fuhre gesehen. Um, and then in Devonian with I have a seen a bird. Now, all English speakers have some uh, fossilised remnant of this. So the word enough, the first syllable of the word enough, the uh, or the i, is a fossilised remnant of this, uh, this, this prefix from Old English. And all English speakers uh, do that. So the, the, the Dutch word would be something like genoeg. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that quite right. Um, but these later Devonian dialects were the only ones that kept it as a, um, a productive part of the grammar of the language. Um, it seems to have died out in the north of England before it died out anywhere else, um, with a lot of other inflection which also died out in the north of England. Um, and it, it was probably flickering away towards the end of the Old English period in the north of England. Um, but it stayed strong in the Middle English period in other dialects, and clearly well into the modern English period uh, in Devon in the West Country. Um, and there are a few, you know, there are a few other things um, in the West Country that are holdovers from um, Old English or even early Old English before Norse influence took hold in the rest of the country. So, for example, um, the, the form of the word be um, that is bist, so how bist thou, um, which is direct directly cognate, and in fact the same word as the German word bist, as in um, wie, wie alt bist du. Um, and this is, this is a word that, that existed in early Old English throughout the rest of the country, but was replaced with the, um, the Norse-derived word art in most of the rest of the country by the end of the Old English period, so how art thou rather than how bist thou. But in Devon it's, it's you know, it stuck around well into the 19th century, probably into the 20th century, and I'm sure there are some older speakers that still use it today in some contexts. And if you know any of those older speakers, um, let, let us know in the comments because um, I'm sure I'm sure it's the, it's the kind of thing that would still be hanging around today. Um, another thing I've touched on before is a kind of elision that was very commonplace in Old English, and that's the elision of the word ne um, to just n at the beginning of certain words. Um, and this was so standard in, in 
contractions with certain other words that it was actually acceptable in writing and in fact um, by a certain point it was it was standard in writing so it was almost unusual not to write the contraction um, so each habbe would become each nabbe um, elm would become neum uh, what else walde would become nolde um, and so on and this 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 was so standard in speech that it was actually normal in writing and it was standard in writing as well um, and this this um, this would have been used in conjunction with other um, negative forms to make double negatives. So in, in I think the first Baldrick video I used the sentence where nabban nani childra and I pronounced it wrong in the original video but I think that that what I just said was more more true to sort of late West Saxon. Um, where nabban nani childra so what that that what that means with the contractions taken out in modern English is we not have not any children. Um, and if you were to add the contractions in the same way as they work in, in Old English, in Modern English, it would be we nav nanny children, but obviously that's not that's not something you can say in Modern English, that doesn't work. Um, it's not acceptable in Modern English, in any dialect I know. Um, but there are fossilised forms of words that retain this this sort of ghost of the the ne with the elided final vowel. So one example of this is uh, the phrase hobnob, and before it was a, a kind of biscuit, it originally meant to sort of give, give, give and take, or to have and to not have. Um, and it seems to have come into the language, possibly via a dialect that retains some of these negative forms, um, and the original Old English would have been something like habbe nabbe, or hubban nabban, um, to have or not to have to have and not to have. Um, another is another example is willy nilly, um, which which um, obviously comes from the word will, which uh, originally meant to want. So the, the 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 earliest meaning was probably something like whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not. Um, and this is what we find in in some of its earliest usage. Um, Another one, which you might have seen on, on QI, because I think they covered it briefly, um, is the word nickname. Now, if you're, if you're familiar with German, if you know any German, you'll, you'll be aware of the word auch, which means also. Um, and Old English actually had a cognate of this, which meant the same thing, and that was auch. Um, <coughs> and this survived into, into standard Middle English with eck. And you'll find this in Chaucer's works a fair bit. Um, so, for example, in the Canterbury, the Canterbury Tales, the line uh, Juan Zephyrus Eck with his sweet breath, uh, in spirit hath in every halt and heath. Um, now, if a couple of people you knew had the same nama in Middle English, you would give them an Eck nama, an Eck nama, and this was an, an also name, an additional name to distinguish them by so that you could tell the difference between these two people. Now the word ek on its own slowly died out as people just stopped using it as words do. But the word eknama was still, you know, was still in use. Um, and eventually people probably just forgot what the word ek had, had even meant in the first place. They just used eknama to mean an additional name you give someone. <coughs> now with the great vowel shift Eknama became Iknam. Iknam, as it was said rapidly by people over time, became Iknam. Because most people were illiterate at that point, people reanalyzed the phrase because because they never saw it in writing. People reanalyzed the phrase an Iknam as a nickname. And the word Nickname, nickname was born, which obviously survives as the modern word nickname and also name, a name you give someone um, aside from their normal name. Um, uh, this this kind of reanalysis happens a fair bit in um, communities that don't read or write. So so it happened with the word apron, which used to be napron, because people started saying an apron instead of a napron. <coughs> 
I'm sorry, this cough is. A... I've got it. Um, I'm going to turn probably predictably to Cumbrian at this point, um, and I'm going to give a few examples of prepositions which are um, Scandinavian derived from a time when Old Norse was commonly spoken uh, in the north and east of England, of course, Cumbrian being northwestern. Um, and I think these prepositions were probably used in dialects surrounding Cumbrian. I just don't know much about those dialects, so I can't confirm it. But I assume they were. I know certain ones were used in Yorkshire. Um, the most obvious still existing one is the word till, which means to. But it only means to in the prepositional form. So I'm going to school. I'm going to church. Um, what else? She turned to drugs. Um, older speakers still use this very liberally um, without even noticing it. So my granddad, who's, who's not linguistically aware at all, will use it um, very regularly in speech, especially if he's speaking to other people who are Cumbrian. Um, and he'll usually use it in a, an, an unstressed form, a weak form, which is tl. So, for example, um, I went to his horse. Um, you can see this in Northern English stretching back um, all the way into Middle English documents. Um, and this, this, this clearly comes from the Scandinavian preposition, which is reflected in the modern um, Scandinavian languages, the modern North Germanic languages. The infinitive marker sense of the English word to is taken up by another Scandinavian preposition in Cumbrian, um, which is ut. And a speaker intuitively knows the difference between these two, and it's it's still in use in very broad speakers, so both both till and it are dwindling now in Cumbrian. Um, but in broad 19th century Cumbrian you could say, I wanted gantled horse. And that's not all either, so the preposition e for in is another Scandinavian one. Um, fre is a more recent iteration meaning from, um, although in older texts it's always fro, which is where we get the expression to and fro. Um, now, fro is a more understandable development from the Old Norse word, which was fro. Um, I've actually yet to work out where exactly fre, the pronunciation fre, comes from. Um, you've got a bourne, which is from the Old English word a buvan. You've got a nent, which I think was from the Old English word or nemned. Um, I'll explain this at some point down the line next time I, I do something on Cumbrian. Um, but yeah, you've got lots of Scandinavian loanwords in Northern dialect. Um, but these are a few examples of um, prepositions, which are really core words, core vocabulary words. Um, if any of you can think of anything you're aware of, um, do let me know, because there'll definitely be things I haven't mentioned or I'm not aware of. But those were just a few fun examples um, of leftovers from older stages of English. So thank you very much for watching, and I shall <coughs> see you soon if I don't perish.